thank you very much, guys, for joining us at Beyond Kicking and Punching live Zoom podcast with Sifu the Costco's. <laughs> Yay, I got it right. Terrific. And, you know, this is a great pleasure for me because he is the man when it comes down to it. And again, uh, if you can, I would even highly recommend you guys get to read his book. Where did it go? I just had it. Oh my gosh. It's one of those things, guys. Again, his book. Um, oh my gosh. It's been a long morning. Sorry, Sifu. We're going to definitely have to edit this mm, that's okay right. so again Sifuel, the floor is yours and you can introduce the man himself all right hey guys thank you for joining us um we're gonna have some really fun time with excuse me 40 50 years when he was uh you know just a young a young man getting up into the martial arts in the bay area he's done a lot of things and you know in the back as you can see his alcalade of awards Shows if it shows his accomplishment. You know, I want to hear from the man himself. You know, what we brought in today is um, well known within the stunt world and also into producing and uh, directing and writing films. He's born in uh, San Jose, California, of Chinese descent. He began his film career early in performing martial arts fights uh, sequence in, in the films. Has done a lot of uh, uh, things you know, in the capacity of stunt work, acting, producing, directing, and writing. He began directing music videos in 1996 and has directed, produced to such artists as Master P, Jeremy Dupree, Silly Seal, E-40, uh, The Moses, Silk the Shocker, Sea Murder, et cetera, et cetera. He's also directed his first uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix music video for Experience Hendrix a while back in 1997. And recently he's, he's been the executive producer of a, a film that made number one on, on Netflix, an animated film called Animal Cracker. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you guys to give a good clap and we welcome on to the show here, Beyond Kicking and Punching, Harry Mock. All right, Harry, let's go. Hey, guys. How are you? Thank you for having me, uh, Super Al. Uh, as you said, we've known each other for decades. And uh, also, I've known Malia for decades as well, and I'm uh, honored to be here today on your Zoom podcast. This is going to be exciting. A lot of stuff is going to uh, talk about a lot of stuff, and um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll maybe start off by talking about uh, how I even got into martial arts and how that influenced me into getting into uh, the film industry. How's that? Great. You're going um, right on cue. I just wanted to say how and why you started MA, martial arts. So let's hit it from there. Yeah. Um, I started martial arts when early on, when I was about eight years old. Uh, I lived in Northern California and in the South Bay of Northern California, uh, San Jose area, uh, a lot of the uh, Chinese were uh, chrysanthemum flower growers back in the day. I mean, I'm talking about back in the 50s and 60s into the 70s as well. So my, my parents were involved with growing chrysanthemums and they had a, a, a organization called the Bay Area Chrysanthemum Growers Association. So they had, they bought some land in Mountain View, built a facility and every year, you know, everyone knows how uh, Chinese New Year's is, you know, festivities last for a few weeks. And so as I, as, as, as I was growing up, uh, we would have these Chinese New Year's events at this facility and they realized that, hey, wait, you know, traditionally we got to bring on the, uh, uh, bring together, put together a lion dance team so that way we could, you know, ward off the evil spirits and bring in, open up the new year, bring in, you know, good, good prosperity and everything. So we as the kids were the ones that were taught how to do the lion dancing. So, but what comes along with lion dancing? martial arts, right? Kung Fu, right? But uh, it was mm. interesting because we didn't have anybody, anyone that was teaching uh, a, a Kung Fu at the time, but one of the flower growers that uh, had me do the line dancing, one of his workers was a fourth degree black belt in Shotokan. So I ended up learning mm. Shotokan early on in my, uh, in my early age, you know, and um, uh, later on 
uh, started uh, studying Choi Le Fat, well, Tak Fai Wong. Um, and then I started uh, studying Kaju Kempo in the early 70s over at Gaylord's. And then I also studied at Wing Lam's uh, uh, Siu Lum. So mm -hmm. I was doing this all together at one time, which was back in those days, it really was a no no because, you know, you didn't, your, your, your instructors wanted you to be devoted to them. But I, I didn't do that only because for the reason being is that I, I, I thought each, each style had, had uh, some deficiencies, okay? Uh -huh. And as I was taking uh, the uh, Kung Fu styles, they were teaching us forms. I was like learning forms and forms over forms. You know, gosh, I was like, I think at one time I was up to like 42 forms, you know? And I, I, I wanted to get physical, I wanted to fight. So that's when uh, my neighbor down the street, Manuel Vieira, used to call him Junior Hawaiian, right? Was uh, uh, cousins of uh, Professor Gaylord. <laughs> Uh -huh. And so he took me over to uh, uh, Gaylord's in Fremont, California, this old black belt. So, uh, uh, and it gave me everything that I wanted because I wanted to get physical. Kaju Kempo is a fighting art, right? Uh -huh. And boy, I, I, I just learned how to fight, you know, and, and uh, that's what I really wanted to do. I, I was just wanted to be physical. And then yet in the, in the Kaju Kempo side, they really didn't have any decent forms, right? And I know that. Uh, Al back in the day introduced Siulam Six to them, which I thought was a, a a great thing because they didn't their pinions were just I they're just very basic, you know. And I I, I wanted to do incredible forms. You, you know, know, let me ask you, fun. let me ask you a question because you're talking about the line dancing, right? Yeah. And you started at the uh, uh, early age, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, what part were you playing? The heads or the tail? Oh, I, I was the head bra. <laughs> oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure you wasn't the tail end. <laughs> no, I wasn't the tail end, man, because if I was the tail end, I would have got myself in trouble. <laughs> That's right. What's your right? Okay, uh, <laughs> let me ask you another question. When was the when was your breakout moment? Mm -hmm. When was my breakout moment? My, you know, I I kind of felt my breakout moment was when uh, at 19 years old I opened up my own school and. Um, I, I put together a team of fighters that we ended up becoming the state champions, you know? And, and at that point, I, I was early on, I, when I saw my first Bruce Lee movie, like, like most of all, most of us that back in the day, everybody wanted to be like Bruce Lee. Who didn't want to be like Bruce Lee, you know? So at, uh, after I had accomplished uh, having the uh, uh, state championships, I, I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I need to start moving on to get into my career now. I really need to do this. So I ended up giving up my students to uh, Greg Laguerra at the Crazy Dragons. At that particular time, he had the two world champions, Tammy Whelan and uh, uh, Sash Williams. And, um, and, and Greg was a friend of mine. So I turned my students over to them and uh, they, they actually done very well for themselves. And then I moved in to the film industry. And then I think the, uh, one of the break-in moments was when I, uh, I got a job on Uncommon Valor starring Gene Hackman. Um, uh, and we filmed, I spent about a couple months in Kauai filming. And that's where I had met uh, Al, your, your famous uh, uh, student brother, uh, Eric Lee. And mm. uh, Eric Lee and I became, you know, incredible friends and he I call him to this day my big brother um and uh, <laughs> uh yeah and then and, and then Eric actually opened up a lot of doors for me as well uh, right after we were done filming he asked me he goes hey you want to come with me to Oahu because you know uh, Ed Parker's and uh, Mr. Parker's in uh Oahu right now I said really I said oh god I'd, I'd, I'd love to meet Mr. Parker because one of my goals in life one of my goals in life my bucket list right was to perform center stage at the internationals, uh, just like what Bruce Lee had done to uh, gain a name for himself. So we went and met with Ed Parker in Oahu at a restaurant and Eric introduced uh, me to Ed and Mr. Parker and, and started bragging to Mr. Parker about some of the things that I could do back then. And Mr. Parker looked at me and said, you could do that? And I said, yes, sir, I can. He goes, I want you to perform center stage for me next year at the internationals, which would have been which would be 84, because this was 83, right? 
So I, I was honored to do that. I sent them my demo reel, you know, he, he, he watched the demo reel and scheduled me for, uh, to do a performance in 1984 at the Long Beach Internationals. And I performed uh, and actually got a standing ovation. And, and that was kind of like a, a breakout for me as well, you know. Um, but if you want to, if we want to talk about what really, really inspired me, what really inspired me was the following year, Eric and I, um, Eric asked me, he goes, hey, I got to go to Mexico City to do a, a, a seminar. And he says, you want to come? And I said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd love to go to Mexico City with you. So we, uh, 1985, after, that, that was the, after I had performed uh, at the internationals, which was in August, Right after that, we flew into Mexico City. We got there. Well, Eric, you know, sometimes Eric gets a little ahead of himself, realized that the seminar wasn't until the following week. So we were there a week early. So I'm like, and so Eric says, well, hey, you know what? They're filming Rambo 2 over in Acapulco right now. Why don't we fly over there and go hustle a job? And I said to myself, I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. You know, because I know that a lot of the same guys that worked on Uncommon Valor were working there in, in, uh, on Ramble 2 as well. So we flew over there and met with the stunt coordinator. Stunt coordinator said, hey, yeah, I could really use you guys, you know, uh, to play, you know, Viet Cong soldiers and, and needed more stunt guys. And he says, you know, if you guys could hang around, he, he says, I, you know, uh, they had a big um, storm that blew down the sets. Uh, and here we are staying at a five-star hotel. I was paying $25 a night at a five-star hotel. I said, sure, I'll stay. You know, so we hung, I hung out for a while and then Eric had to go back to Mexico City to do his seminar. So I, I hung out over at, uh, in Acapulco, uh, trying to wait, waiting to get on. And so I remember um, I heard that they're editing at, uh, at the hotel upstairs. And so I, I was kind of cruising around the hotel and I, I found where the editor was at, was at uh, met Richard Halsey, who was the editor who won the Academy Award for editing Rocky One. So I, I, I remember I happened to have some photos with me and I showed them to him. He, he asked me, he says, are you, are you on, working on the show? I said, no, I'm, I'm actually waiting to get on, trying to get on. And I showed him some of my photos. He goes, wow, man, these are great. He goes, why don't you show these to Sly? Because he would hire you up right on the spot. I know he would. And I said, yeah, but how do you even get to him? You know, and uh, he has three, four bodyguards around him all the time back then. And he said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm heading down to, to the set. I have to go talk to him. So why don't you catch a cab with me? We'll go down together and then I'll introduce you to him. And I thought, well, great, you know, which kind of circumvented what the stunt coordinator wanted me to do. I remember prior to that, I was down at the a set, you know, maybe a few days earlier and, and they were where they were filming interiors. And I was standing by this door and all of a sudden the door opens and here comes Rambo walked right out of the door. I mean, bigger than life. I'm like 28 years old, 27, 28. And I was like, oh my God, there's Sylvester Stallone. And so he looked at me and he, he nodded his head at me and I nodded my head back at him. I was like, I, I should have said something. I didn't even say anything because I was like looking at him like, oh my God, that's Rambo, there's Stallone, you know? And so he, at least he acknowledged me. So now here I am again at standing in front of that same door, right? Waiting for Richard because Richard walked over to where the motorhome where, um, where uh, Sly was uh, having lunch. I'm waiting around and then all of a sudden the, the director comes walking out the door. And, and I had met him previous to, and I happened to have my photos with me. I showed it, showed it to him, he goes, wow. And, uh, and then all of a sudden the stunt coordinator comes walking up. And so uh, George Cosmatos, who is the director, goes to the stunt coordinator and he goes, hey, can we use any of this stuff in the movie? This is some good stuff. And he looked at the photos, he goes, yeah. He goes, wow, these are really good. He goes, but you know, the movie moves so fast. I don't know whether or not we could use any of this. And so he says to me, he goes, well, listen, you know, I want to use you, you know, and I don't know when they're going to have the sets up. He goes, listen, why don't you just go ahead and sit waiting around? Why don't you just go ahead and leave your name and address and everything at the production office? And, and, and when I'm ready, I'll call you and I'll have you flown back out. And I thought to myself, I just said, oh, okay, I just agreed, you know, and I thought to myself, wow. I said, well, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, and, and, and Richard has been about an hour and I didn't see Richard. So I literally turned around and I started to walk away to catch a cab back and, you know, do as he said and, and head home. And all of a sudden I hear somebody call my name, Harry, Harry. And I'm like, looked around and there's Richard and he's like, come here, come here. So I went over there 
he knocks on the motorhome door, Sly opens up the door, and Richard said, this is the guy I was telling you about. And Sly says, oh, okay, come on in. So I go in there and I'm sitting with him in his motorhome. I mean, like one-on-one, -on -one, right? We're there, I wasn't in there, I swear, no more than three, four or five minutes at max. And he's looking at my photos and he says, I wanna use you. I'm sure, I, I could do that. You know, and then right after that, we just started talking about all kinds of stuff, you know, people, mutual friends that we knew and so on and so forth. And some, and, and some of the in inspirational things that he told me that uh, I learned at that moment was just, I, it stuck to me to this day. And, and I always share it with people. He was talking about how, when he was filming Rocky One, that how he just hated people that thought they knew everything. And I said, well, how's that? And he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm in the ring. I'm doing my boxing. There's a boxing coordinator there. He's telling me to do things one way. And I said, no, that's not how I want to do it. I'm going to do it my way, this way. And he goes, no, that's not how it's done. And he says, Sly says, no, well, that's how I'm going to do it. You know, so he, it kind of pissed him off, you know, and he says, he says, he says, just remember this. He goes, always do what you feel because what you feel comes from your heart. And if anybody ever tells you, uh, tells you different you tell them to go f themselves and you tell them i told you so and i was like if you could imagine at 27 years old how that's resonating in my head i'm sitting here alone with stallone it's like someone from the uh, from heaven speaking to me and i i took that to heart so anyhow uh make a long story short uh that's how i ended up getting on uh rambo 2 uh it was still there was a still a little bit oh i gotta share this with you a little bit of a conflict because all of a sudden George Cosmatos comes walking through the door and he looks at me, he sees me and there was Sly. Oh my God, he gave me the look of death. Like, what are you doing in here? I thought I told you to go leave your phone number at the office and we'll call you type of look. And all of a sudden Sly says to him, oh, by the way, I wanna use him. I want him to double some kicks for me. So all of a sudden George is like, oh yeah yeah oh did you see his pictures oh they're really good oh yeah really nice and i'm like i'm like this guy was like a real kiss ass right so then i told <laughs> sly i said i said I, I said sly listen um uh i told the coordinator i'd i'd you know i'd leave my name at the office you know and 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 he was going to hire me later and he said oh don't worry about it let's I'll, let's go come on come with me i'll go let him know right now so we go out there we meet up with the the, the stunt coordinator right and the technical advisor who supposedly had 40 recorded kills in Vietnam, you know, later to find out that he was a fraud, but, but then everybody thought he was this, you know, this war hero, right? So anyhow, he's standing there talking to the stunt coordinator. He's telling him, hey, listen, I want to use him. I want him to double some kicks for me. All of a sudden, the technical advisor chimes in. What are you talking about using kicks? He goes, we can't use that. You know, it's not effective. It doesn't work. And he says, he says, yes, it, you know, what do you mean it doesn't work? I've seen people knock people out with one kick in a bar. And all of a sudden the technical advisor says, yeah, but we're not talking about a bar. We're talking about where this is live combat. And he charges, charges Sly and Sly lifts his leg up and does a straight kick and kicks him in the gut. And I'm like, Harold Diamond, who's a, now a stunt coordinator, big time stunt guy, he looked at me, he says, Harry, he goes, man, you don't know the toes you're stepping on. This is only one movie and compared to all the movies you're going to work on. And I told him, I told Harold, I said, listen, I told Sly, I just assumed leave. But Sly told me, no, this is my, my gig. And I was like, okay. So, but what, but after that, I, you know, I, I talked to that, that technical advisor. I apologized to him. I didn't mean for that to happen. He goes, don't worry about it. He says, just do a good job for Sly. But because of all the uh, uh, political BS that happened on the set that was going on, uh, I never did double kicks for him. I was prepared to, uh, but I, I ended up uh, uh, dying a couple times. But my main claim to fame in Rambo 2 is when he shot me in the head with an arrow and pinned me to a post. You know, so that was always <laughs> a memorable scene, right? <laughs> well, that's a real good headshot. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. Right. You know, um, <clears throat> It seems to me that, you know, Eric really got you started or got you inspired and, you know, meeting up with uh, Sylvester Stallone, you know, that's just like a double cracker that uh, really, really got you going, you know, so you have a lot of inspirational things, but, you know, I'm sure that working on the set, 
have they ever come close to where you became, uh, uh, you felt like you, you were in a, a near death experience? A near death experience? Mm -hmm. well, I, I tell you what, um, there was, there was, there was an incident. I remember there was an incident, you know, I've always, you know, when, whenever you're doing uh, choreography and fight scenes and stunts and stuff like that, everything is always, you know, calculated, right? You know, but there's right. things that are the most dangerous is what you cannot calculate. And, and, I, and I tell you what, I remember here we are filming in the jungle, right? And, uh, 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 and I always remember this because it's what you, what is scary is what you don't have control over, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Rambo's flying over in his Huey, right? And we're running in front of this and, and he blew up this, this hut. I mean, it went, they had primer cord set up, gallons of fuel and boom. I mean, they blew this thing up. And I tell you, I, I was at a distance but I still felt the heat just going at me, right? So he flies across, blows us up, we're shooting at him, right? And the most important thing was to be careful of all the debris that was coming down because as it went up, we had to run in front of this place. All this stuff is going up. And then as it starts to come down, we have to take off, right? Well, the guy in front of me was slightly delayed and there was a piece of wood that came, came down and jabbed him right below his eye, almost took his eye out, you know? And I always remember that. It, it, even though it didn't affect me, but it, it made me think, you know, what is what you cannot control is the most dangerous part. So uh, I didn't have a life, um, uh, my, my experience of near death was, was actually from a car accident back in 2013. You know, I almost, I almost died in a car accident. You know, that's, you know, that's the part that, and that was out of my control. So uh, when you're in control, it's always something that's more calculated and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be as worried. So I've been very fortunate other than that car accident. Originally your family came from, uh, from China? Yes, yes, yes. My um, uh, interesting story with that as well. Uh, my dad uh, flew, was here already in the US. He had arranged marriage with my mom, flew back to China, married my mom, and, um, and came back uh, and started, tried to, to come back to start the process to bring her over here, right? And back in those days, if you could imagine back in the 40s, right? I mean, it could take a decade or more to try and get somebody over here. Very difficult back in those days. But what had happened was after my father had left China, it was right there during that time when the Japanese invaded China, okay? And so my, here's my mom, like everyone's running for their lives. Everyone's, you know, go, trying to move from village to village. Well, my mom finds out that she's pregnant, okay? With my oldest brother. And so after, you know, she, she's running for her life, moving from village to village, she ends up having my oldest brother, right? And she, she's trying to get out, get somewhere where she could be safe to raise her child, right? So she's able to find a boat that was, was, was crossing over to Hong Kong, to Macau, and she snuck on this boat with some people. And if, if the, if the, uh, during the war, if the Japanese would have saw them, they would have blew the ship right out of the water, right? But she made it her way to Hong Kong and Macau and complete, com just lost contact with my family completely because back then, no phone, no computer, no, no way of communication. Lost complete contact with my dad for 19 years, for 19 years. And she raised my oldest brother. My oldest brother is 23 years older than I am. Okay, so one day she, she's in Macau, she bumps into a mutual friend that happened to know my dad. And she says, have you seen your, have, have you seen him? My dad's name was Henry. She goes, have you seen Henry? And, and they said, well, yeah, I, I think I, I, last I heard he was working in the gambling houses in San Francisco. So she says, can you give deliver, if you see him, if you could find him, if you could give him this message and let him know that I, I'm, I'm okay. And he has a son that's like 19 years old, well, 18, that was getting ready to turn 19. And, and so she, when she get, came back to the States, delivered that message to my dad and my dad, was like, you know, wow, he, he, he like, I have a, my wife is alive. I have a kid that's almost 19 years old. 
he went and got a legitimate job working for a gentleman by the name, a multimillionaire by the name of George Gant in Monterey and Pebble Beach, right? As a, working as a butler chef. So this gentleman, uh, George Gann, was in the telecom business, and he was the one that was responsible for setting up the telecom system in China. So, mm. so he, he told my, uh, my dad worked there and as he was working and he saved up some money. He asked Mr. Gann if he could help move some of that money, uh, wire some of that money over to, uh, to my mom, to his wife in Macau, right? And so Mr. Gann says, yeah, sure, sure, Henry, I'll help you. So he helped him and did that. You know, a couple months go by, he asked Mr. Gann to do it again. And so Master, Mr. Gann just was curious and asked him, he goes, well, Henry, I, do you have family there or something? You know, what's, you know, you're wiring money. So I know it's not my, any of my business, but, you know, you, you're sending money to your family. And so my dad told him, he goes, well, I have a wife and kid that I haven't seen in nearly 19 years, you know, because of what happened with the war and everything. And, and George Gann was so compelled with that, that he told my dad, he said, Henry, he says, my goodness, he goes, I'm going to on vacation to Taj, Taj Mahal from Taj Mahal. I'm going to go straight into Hong Kong and I'm going to get your wife and your son and I'm going to bring them back with me. And lo and behold, that is exactly what he did. And if it wasn't for Mr. Gan, I would not exist. Okay. What, my what other year, brother would not exist. You know, what year, so, what year was that? Pardon me? What year was that? Oh gosh, that was in the, that was in the, I believe that was in the fifties, in the early fifties, right around there. Mm. Okay. And then, um, and so, so when my, when, when uh, they, when he was bringing my mom and uh, oldest brother here, uh, apparently, you know, when you're a wealthy man, you got connections, you know, right. to, to, to people in high offices, you know, so he was able to get them over here, like not a problem at all, other than he had an incident with one of the person from immigration saying, uh, uh, holding them up and Mr. Gann, my mom, I remember my mom telling me, she says, I've never seen Mr. Gann so upset before. And Mr. Gann would, was, uh, the gentleman was holding up the process and Mr. Gann said, if you don't let this lady and her son through, do you know who I am? I will have your job. And, and the guy was like, no, Mr. Gann, no, Mr. Gann, it's okay. It's okay. I know everything's going to be fine. We're going to, they're going to get through. Okay. You know? So mm -hmm. that happened. And then they had my other brother who's three years older than I am. And then I myself was actually an accident because at that point, my dad was in his mid fifties and my mom was in her mid forties, you know, and my mom said they weren't planning to have me, but it just happened. <laughs> Yeah, you know what's interesting about the person that brought your family over because during the during the the uh, early twenties and thirties and forties, you know, Chinese and Asians was really discriminated upon, and I know that in China, in the history of American history, segregation, especially when it came to the the Chinese because they work on the railroads, they 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 were they were lynched, they were put into segregations, and it really didn't open up until. 1943. So, you know, it was interesting to know that, you know, before 1943, you didn't have any, any Chinese coming in because they all, they held them up on the uh, uh, San Quentin Island, you know, exactly. uh, nobody could get in, the, in there. And some of them, many of them were even sent back. But to hear that, you know, that your family came inside, you know, afterwards, that's a, a really amazing because there's been a lot of uh, well, Chinatown wouldn't have been there if they didn't allow the Chinese to grow much bigger than they are. Anyway, that's interesting to know about your family. Yeah, you did send me a package, and here, here it is, right? This, the yeah. mask you sent me. And yeah. um, the interesting part about this mask is just that you told me about it, but when I put it to my nose, it has that scent of cinnamon. Is it cinnamon? It's, it's cinnamon and clove in combined with various other essential oils. And the, the reason why it has that brown look, because that's copper. So the mass, uh, it's a mass that we invented that we are in manufacturing of right now as we speak. Uh -huh. It's an antiviral mask. We're submitting to EUA this month to get our uh, approval for EUA and it kills the virus on contact. Wow, it's interesting. So at least you're doing something, <laughs> masking everybody up. <laughs> well, yeah, you, great. You, know, you know what, even when they start, uh, if there's a, if, if it is that they start reducing the, you know, um, you know, uh, people to not have to wear the mask, you know, but it could be still used in hospitals, government, you know, 
uh, and and also they're talking you know they're already talking about COVID 20 COVID 21 you know you hear Gates talking about that and it's like okay all right well we're going to be prepared for that you know mm. and and the, the masks are going to be available uh, here very soon and we're also what we're doing we're applying the same technology to HVAC filters for filtrations for commercial buildings airlines um, uh, cars, vacuums, things of that nature as well. So that way uh, it could help to reduce some of the spread of this virus. Wow, there's a lot of things going on. So, you know, yes. I, you're gonna be living, uh, living, uh, living behind a lot of good legacies. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things that, that goes on in a person's life, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, as, as growing up and getting into a lot of your activities, I'm going to ask you a question. What's your worst fear? My worst fear. My worst fear right now, I, I have so much going on right now. And, and my worst fear is, is you know, we, we've seen these past years, especially last year, uh, uh, but even the past several years, I, I've, I've had so many friends. I remember one year, three years ago, three years ago, that one year I had four friends that went to bed and never woke up, you know, and, and, and uh, probably sleep apnea, heart attack, so on and so forth. I, I think one of my worst fears is to, to leave here and not finishing what I've set out to do, you know, finishing my, 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 my projects, you know, and uh, another fear is, is what lies ahead with what's happening to the world right now, you know, and, people being put in a situation where, you know, um, uh, forced to, you know, now we're taking, uh, everyone's having to take vaccines and everything like that, you know, and, and they're gonna, you know, try, they're trying to mandate that, they're trying to get everyone to take these vaccines and, and I've never taken a vaccine, you know, and I, I don't wanna contaminate my body. That's just me personally, doesn't mean that you know, people shouldn't be taking vaccines, but for me, vaccines are not for everybody, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm one of those people that feel that my, my, my immune system is so strong right now. I do all the right things to build it. Um, and, and I have access to certain products like what I had uh, sent you, Al, that can, uh, uh, that can alleviate the, the COVID-19 and, and it's been proven to work. And so I, I, I just, I just don't, I choose not to do that. So my fear is that uh, if that forces that on everybody, like now they're talking about having a, a vaccine passport. So what, you can't hop on a flight to go anywhere unless you have the vaccine. So they're finding a way to get everybody inoculated with this vaccine. And, and, and I think that that's so unfair because there's a lot of people that do not, you know, cho have chosen not to take it. You know, and for very many reasons, and I don't want to get into that because I don't want to turn this into a political thing. But you know, we all should be able to have our choice, right? You know, interesting. Yeah, a question. You know, if you had to do things all over again, what would you do? You know, what I would do is, you know, when I when I was when I was younger, um, I I just really felt like. I, I felt like I could only I could only move forward so much because I there was a fear that you know you're, you're you're young you know you you don't know what life has in in stored for you you know and there's a certain fear of about you know what am I gonna what am I gonna become you know where am I gonna be at in life you know and and um, how am I gonna how am I gonna live out my life I think if I were to do something all over again. I think I'd be, I, I would be far more assertive, you know, and, I, and, and really push harder in my, in my dreams and my career and what I wanted to do and, and utilize, uh, utilizing my martial arts experience as that no surrender, no retreat at, attitude to go out there and, and, and just like if you're sparring in competition, what is your objective, right? Mm -hmm. Your objective is to win, okay? Right. And you're going to do everything that you possibly can to win. If you get in a fight, what is your objective? Your objective is to win because you're defending yourself. You have mm -hmm. to defend yourself. Otherwise, you're going to get hurt. So I use the same attitude with martial arts and in, in life's experiences, right? Is if I set out a goal to do something, I set it out and, and I'll, I'm, I set out to go and do it. 
which I'm doing now. I wish I would have done that earlier on in my life. Like now I have that no nonsense attitude. I'm involved with so many different if I told you what I was involved with right now, from, from the mass technology to the filtration technology to the cannabis industry to bringing in new technologies, nano, nano bubble technologies, AI health technologies, you know, I, I, mean, I could go into all this stuff that I'm involved with right now uh, and it would just make your mind just want to pop because there's just so much that I'm involved with right now. And, so and the greatest all, challenge you have right now is just putting it into order. Absolutely, and it's all it's all coming together as we speak, um, you know, and, and not not even to mention what I'm doing in the film industry. You know, my mm -hmm. my movie Animal Crackers was the number one blockbuster hit last summer, the number one animated feature film last summer. Uh, Forbes magazine did a write up last month uh, describing the uh, fifty the fifty top films that dominated Netflix within the past twelve months, and our film was within that top fifty films. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Is there um, a follow up on that movie? Uh, yeah, we have the sequel. We do have we've written the sequel. And uh, I, I put together we have a, a slate. We have a, we have a slate of 10 films that we're going to do. And uh, they were I just last month submitted them uh, to Hulu to, to to see if they'd be interested in, in funding our slate, getting involved with our slate, which includes Animal Crackers, too which is it's going to be even better than Animal Crackers 1. If you if you anyone had a chance to see Animal Crackers 1, um, uh, it'll even be that much more better. We have a huge cast, uh, John Krasinski, Emily Blunt, Sylvester Stallone, Danny DeVito, Sir Ian McKillen, Gilbert Gottfried, Raven Simone, Patrick Warburton, Harvey Firestein, Wallace Shawn, just a huge, amaz amazing cast. Well, I saw it and, um, you know, I, on some parts I had to replay it. They said, wow, it's pretty good, man. You know, and I know that, um, how long did you guys take to, uh, to film that? Um, you know, animation takes a lot longer than, than your live action because, you know, you have a team of like, we had a team like of about 120 people working on this nonstop. Um, and the animation just, just takes a long time. Now, Disney, DreamWorks and uh, uh, Pixar, it takes them on average about four years plus to do, uh, to do an animated feature. Uh, we got ours done in two and a, two and a half years. It's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, wow! You know, you you leave me with a lot of questions, and you know, it's it's not surprising. I mean, you've got a lot of things going on your plate. You know, here's the thing that you know that uh, I see. You know, you, you you've done so much, and I can see that you 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 put in all efforts to help. You know, cure this um, or curtail. The pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. and hopefully with your your products coming out, that's going to make a, a real good dent into the spread of the COVID uh, uh, thing. And you also talked about you know your your new projects, you know, and you know you you pretty well fit. How do you schedule out your workout regimen? You you know I, I this has been a, a life journey. You know I started off uh, um, I actually started off when I was 18 years old into lifting weights, you know, to, uh, I, knowing early on, I wanted to be like Bruce Lee. Well, I wanted to look like Bruce Lee too. I wanted to have that physique like Bruce Lee, right? And if any of you've ever seen any of my photos, I actually replicated Bruce Lee and then I surpassed Bruce Lee's physique. And my regiment, and because I started early on, I've made it like my whole life to, uh, of, of health and fitness and martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you have to look at your, your body as a temple, okay? And you have to maintain its structure. And here I am, I'm 63 years old. You know, uh, uh, I took a picture last year, ripped the shreds, full six pack, everything, just vascular ripped the shreds, right? And it's because it's the, 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 the life that I chose to lead, you know, uh, in health and fitness. This, you know, in martial arts. And so my regiment to still to this day, I worked out this morning. Today is I, I train five days a week and with my uh, with my weight training as well as my martial arts. Wow, you remind me of Malia. Malia does the same thing. I mean, it's never ending. Oh, uh, Malia is incredible. Absolutely. Oh, by yeah. the way, Ma Ma Malia's they call her my my photo wife. <laughs> <laughs> 
we take when we take pictures together, all her friends said, Ooh, who's that? You know, and thinking that, you know, it's her new boyfriend or something like that. So we I call her my photo wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're talking about abs, both you and her got it. Yeah. So that's really great. Uh, matter of fact, I'm gonna have her on the show in a few weeks uh, uh, on. So now what exactly or where 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 do you go from now? I mean, now, where's your, where's your direction? My direction right now? Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, uh, again, you know, um, we're, we're, uh, we're, I should find, I should know soon about our slate of films with Hulu. You know, if they, if they accept it, that'll keep me busy for years to come. Uh, if not, then I just move on. I'll maybe go back to Netflix and, uh, or Amazon or, or Apple, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, or independently, we have some sources right now that actually are um, looking at our slate to do independently, which would actually be a, a, a much better choice for, choice for me. So, and moving forward right now, <clears throat> I'll continue in the film industry. I'm actually right now writing a story entitled The 13. And uh, the movie, this movie would be live action and it would take place pre-China, which would be the kingdoms. And it would entail utilizing a lot of different martial artists of, of all cultures, nationalities, right? And I, I could assure you this, you know, being in the business as long as I have, being in martial arts as long as I have, I could assure you this, this will be one of the most action packed. Uh, uh, I, I wanna make it a series because as a series, what I could do is I could rotate martial artists such as like yourself, Al, uh, Mr. Ron Liu, who I see here. Hi, Ron. Um, and utilize all all my my uh, all my hey Bobby hey <laughs> Bobby what's up brother and and utilize all my uh, uh, you know martial arts connections and they 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 would be on in episodes but their characters could be reoccurring as well um, and but it'll be the most exciting most dynamic uh, uh, action martial arts series that you I'll blow everybody out of the water this new kung fu series whatever you know it's not even going to be able to compared to this so that's something that i, I want to do i have a, a script that i've written called lion dance which i want uh, my godfather james hong to uh to do for him to star in and i know he's just turned 92 but he's still working believe it or not and he's in good health right now and uh, james as you know uh, started in, uh, uh played low pan and big trouble in old china and starred in over 600 films and television so uh that right now uh is very timely because that film will connect some of the cultures together because right now we need that so badly because of all the Asian hate that's happening right now going on uh, around the world. And uh, last week I was in San Francisco in front of over a week ago today, I was in front of over 3000 people at a rally uh, just you know, speaking about you know, what we need to do to you know, pull, pull everybody together as a unit. You know? And stop this hate crime. Stop the hate crime, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, as I move forward, again, I, I got the mask, I'm doing, dealing with the filters, I'm dealing with a, a AI technology for health. Uh, that uh, new technology is a, a patch that would go on somebody. It's, it would be good for not only track and trace, but the patch, what it does is that it will, uh, through, through Bluetooth and through your doctor, it will read your, your, your oxygen level, uh, it'll read your um, uh, temperature, it will read your heart rate. So that way remotely, uh, because now you can't even get to get into a doctor to see them, you know, you got to call them and they'll do a zoom with you or they'll send your prescriptions or they'll uh, uh, set you up to go to, you know, if you need to have blood work done or whatever. And now, bef you know, now they don't even hardly see clients, you know. So what, if they do it remotely, if we uh, utilizing this patch, this, this, then it would be so much, so helpful. And it'll allow also children to go back to school because now, you know, they could detect whether or not the kid has a fever or not, you know, you know, if his oxygen level is low or whatever, you know, then they would be able to detect that right away. So that's another project that we're working on right now that I'm involved with. And then also, um, uh, uh, I, 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 okay, I, I, I'm in the cannabis business. Okay, I got myself <laughs> into that business. Okay, all right, whatever. But I, I gotta tell you, at, at 63, when I was 12 years old, was when I was smoking my first joint. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you tell I, me you about know. that. 
but you know what, you know, you're a kid, everyone's experiencing whatever they experience. But I, I actually stopped doing that stuff when I was like 14. And, and uh, cause I realized what I wanted to do in my career. So I, I just stopped all the nonsense and, and moved and moved forward to get myself into the best shape of my life. And now today I do utilize cannabis so I could sleep. It allows me uh, when I, I, I don't, I, I don't abuse it. I just take enough that allows me to sleep because otherwise I will literally wake up at least a couple times in the middle of the night. And when you wake up and you feel like you got to go to a bathroom, what are you going to do? You got to get up and go to the bathroom. Right. right. And I want to, I want to sleep throughout the night. So I, I've involved myself in to uh, that industry yeah. as well. Uh, and then also some new technologies coming out of uh, Japan right now. We uh, with uh, nano bubbles and nano bubbles, uh, is a technology that's just absolutely amazing. And it, what it does is it, 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 it's, it could be used as a disinfectant, you know, and without using chemicals at all, just nano bubbles. It produces these oxygen bubbles that are so small and that they stay in the water. It's not like a bubble when you fill up something, you see all these bubbles come up. No, these nano bubbles stay in the water and they, and, and, and it's, it's capable of uh, killing bacteria. So we're working on that, uh, bringing that into the country as well. And some other okay. technologies. Is that is it drinking water? You can drink it as well, and it's highly oxygenated. You can drink it as well. Uh, what they're doing, they did test with this in Japan. They took, they were the first time ever done in history where they took a fresh water fish, a koi fish, and stuck it in the same tank with a salt water fish mm -hmm. in nano bubble water, and they both to this day are surviving in this one tank, and then. Also, they did comparison studies uh, raising fish in nano bubble water, whereas uh, they took two fish the same size, right? Same size, put it in nano bubble water, fed them the same, and one fish grew literally twice as big as the other fish that was not in nano bubble water. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and then also, one other thing that they did to, to, to prove the test, right? You know, a, a company that was processing oysters in, in Japan, well, when they process oysters, they use salt, they use chlorine, you know, and, and affects the taste of the oyster. So when they got word of the nanobubble technology that would kill these the different bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. They started using the nanobubble technology, cut out the chlorine, cut out the salt, salt, and it did everything that they wanted to do. And their oysters now taste, you could taste the pure flavor of that oyster. So that it's being used for a lot of different things right now. Wow, you got a lot of things going. So, um, you know, it looks that it looks to me that, you know, a lot of people use failures as a means as a stepping stone. How do you, you how do you see failures to you? you? You know, we, we, <laughs> you know, if you throw enough shit up on the wall, something bound to stick, right? So <laughs> right. That's my, that's my, that's my attitude, you know, because in life, we're going to fail. We are going to fail at, at a lot of different things. And if, if, if you don't fail, you're not going to learn how we, we learn from our failures. Correct. And I, I've made so many mistakes when I was younger. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes and I wish the only thing that I wish is that I, I knew what I know today back then, and it would have uh, prevented me from, you know, you know, make, uh, do, making all these failures, you know, creating these failures, you know, I think I would have been that much more successful, but I learned from them and I never make those mistakes again. So I utilize every failure that I've had and there's, don't, trust me, there's been a lot of them, right? But you got to keep on pounding. You got to keep pounding through them. You cannot, if you know, if you're working on a project and you, and, and you've done everything that you could to try to make that succeed and you finally, you realize that this is not going to happen. Don't, don't just sit there and keep on pounding at it, man. You got to start moving, move on, move on with it. You know, unless it's, unless you've invented something and you've created something that, that, that could be a disruptive technology or something that could help society or whatever, then yes, you could keep on pushing with that until time will, 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 it'll be a, there's always a God given time for everything. Okay. Even for technology, you know, and I, I learned early on when I, I made a movie with James Hong that I produced, I created and produced and James Hong starred in and direct called the vineyard. Right. It ended up becoming a, a cult classic, a horror movie. I like that. 
Yeah. So mm. I, 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 what I did was I, I, I finished that movie and I thought, man, we're going to make millions off of this. You know, we're going to hit it big time and all this. And I, I realized what I realized when we sold the movie, all my investors were made profit right off the bat. And, and back then there was a couple other friends that I was, knew that were making, you know, movies and, and none of their movies made money, you know? And, and so I felt so blessed that, you know, my movie made movie money, but I thought, man, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make all this money on this movie. Well, I didn't make millions of dollars on the movie. We got our, we had a minimum guarantee of, we made the movie for 280,000. We got paid 600,000 as a minimum guarantee. And then if we would have sold 10,000 videos or more, then we got another hundred thousand, yada, yada, yada. But I didn't make the millions of dollars like I thought I was. And I, and I realized that, you know what? I can't keep on trying to beat this to death, you know, to think I'm going to make the money out of it. We had... They did not take the theatrical rights. We so we were able to retain the theatrical rights, and they said that if you want to try and do a theatrical of it, with it, we're going to have to cross collateralize what we're paying you, which is guaranteed six hundred thousand, uh, 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 cross collateralize with that funds that we're going to pay you. If your movie goes theatrical and it fails, we're going to take that money from what w- your minimum guarantee. And we thought, well, God, should we take that our invest a chance with our investors' money that they've already we know that they've already made, you know? And we thought, no, we shouldn't. Although what we did was we we had some theaters in Atlanta that would uh, we had a couple prints, and they said that they'll take the film. So we ended up playing the movie in Atlanta, and it was playing up against. I remember back then it was up against a Lou Diamond Phillips film, Renegade. Yeah, Renegade, and we. The, the, the one of the newspapers that, you know, did the, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, reviews on movies. He watched the movie and man, he did this beautiful write up and called it a four star howler, you know, and I was like, whoa, this guy loved our movie. And then James and I always thought, oh, God, what would have happened if we would have, if we would have tried and gone theatrical with this, you know, but what do you do? Do you take that chance of you know, your, your investors are going to be in profit or do you take the chance of losing their money? So we didn't want to take that chance, you know, but we knew in our heart, I think had we did the movie a year earlier, just a year earlier, I think we could have done it theatrically and, and really had a nice little hit on our hands. And if we would have launched it during Halloween. <laughs> so, you know, these are lessons that we learned, right? You know, you, know, you did a lot and we've covered a lot of things and what I'd like to do is bring you back on the show and go into part two, yeah? And I hope that uh, we, can, we can find some time to do it, which I'm, I'm sure we can. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty much running out of time at now, but what kind of word of wisdom would you leave our audience with? Word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. You know, you guys, everybody out there really needs to to be more assertive in their life, you know? And, and, and like last year, this past year, when this whole pandemic hit, everyone was subject to staying at home, you know, and, and people not being able to go to work, you know, and people losing their jobs and just so many negative things that happened this past year. But me, I took that as a, you know what? I need to go out there and make something happen during this time because I am not going to sit down and, and, and just wait for it to happen. If I don't go out and chase it, you know, I, nothing's going to happen. So my word of advice is, you know, I, I like I, I brought in six mask manufacturing machines. We created this new product. We're manufacturing overseas. We've got uh, like orders, like a, 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 a PO coming in for 30 to 50 million pieces a month for a year. Okay. So I went out that last year, I created this. Okay. I created this and I went and did it. So you guys out there, my word of advice is don't sit around and wait for it to come knocking at your door. You know, you, everyone has resources. Everybody has ideas, you know, live out your dreams and, and, and find a way to make that happen. You know, do you have resources? You have friends, families, people that would believe in you, you know, get out there and, 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 make it happen, you know, make it, make something happen. Don't wait for it to happen, you know, and, and, and speak out, do, do, do whatever it is, whatever it takes. You know, I, that's what I do. I, I don't let nothing hold me back, nothing at all whatsoever. I, I refuse to, because if I do, I might as well just lay down and, 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 and die, you know, and, and that's not me. I'm not going to let that happen. So my, uh, my word of advice is, you know, go out there, do the best that you can be the best that you can you know, and, and try everything that your heart's desire. 
And like Stallone said, do what you feel because what you feel comes from your heart. And if anybody ever tells you anything different, you tell them to go up themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, it's been a pleasure talking to you. You gave, gave, gave us a lot of insights. And, you know, I'm sure that your, 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 your mask and all the products is really going to do some really good to the world uh, because you're actually serving the community. And I would tell a lot of the people if they haven't even seen Animal Cracker, they're going to have to see it. And if you saw it again, then just have your kids see it. I think it's one of one of the great animated films, you know, and I really like it, you know. And I also read up on on the, uh, the, um, the vineyard with uh, James Hong. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know horror films really do pull in money, you know, and um, because people like horror things. Yeah, you got a lot of things going good. And I really thank you for being on my show. And you guys out there, you know, um, if you really appreciate it, show me a thumbs up and give me a good clap here for, for, Jay, uh, for, for Harry. And um, listen, guys, if you have any kind of questions, don't hesitate to ask. And I'm going to turn it over to Sonny. Sonny got a few words to before we close up. Thank you, Sifu. Uh, that was a great interview, Harry. I really appreciate you being on Sifu Al's uh, live podcast. It was terrific. Learned a lot. Um, if anything, if you can also email or put it in a chat line where maybe we could possibly get some of those masks because um, some people were asking about it as well. So if Absolutely. you can do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, again, folks, thank you for joining in. And again, just to remind you guys that uh, Sifu Al has his book out, Legacy. And it is on sale on Amazon. Uh, it's, a, it's a great book. I would highly recommend it. And at the same time, there's more to come, which uh, he's working on right now. Also, as you can see on my shirt, where it says the Coscosmartialarts.com, it also has all of his uh, videos set that he's reselling and getting ready for the big launch for his new product on DTS, which is going to be an ongoing, continuing education program. Again, thank you for joining us. Make sure you guys, this is also going to be replayed on YouTube, so make sure you like it, okay? Uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, hit that bell icon so that this way you get notified for all the other new uh, videos that Sifu Al will be posting because all he really wants to do is educate, inspire, and hopefully leave a great legacy of new and upcoming leaders. So again, thank you very much, guys. So if you guys all want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome and say thank you to Harry and Sifu Al's uh, podcast by all means thank you for joining us today i see malia there hi malia julia hi julia bobby oh. alfred kelly ron brother ron matthew john kalapi gina sean all right thank you guys for joining us today angie hey angie yeah one last thing i want to say um sunny here up yo yes, um sir. before we um, end yeah, um, let me just uh, do this real quick. Next week, Saturday, you know, I have uh, Chad Owens, who's a professional football player out of Canada, and uh, I'm going to be there. That's going to be April 10th. And April 17th, I have a Grandmaster Ron Liu. And then on April 24th, I have uh, Chung Lee. And then on May 1st, I have Sunny Su. And then on May 8th, I have Malia Burnell. And then on May 22nd, Art Camacho. And on June 5th, we have Mike Mathers. And I have a whole bunch of people that I... I have coming up in the rest of the year. We're going to be posting that and so that, you know, there's a lot of people I, I like on coming on because they are very inspirational and have projected, you know, inspiration and motivation to the rest of the world. So that said, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you guys again for the last time. And, and uh, I guess I would say aloha, mahalo nui loa, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Happy Easter weekend. Oh, that's right. Happy yeah. Easter. Oh, man. Happy Easter. All right. All right. Happy that's Easter fine. to all Happy you folks. Man. You're right. So, so I don't know if you guys going around looking for 
they're bunny eggs. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out how a bunny have an egg anyway. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Take care. God bless. Bye. Take care.